Uh, hello. Um, so uh, this is a, um, a talk that I prepared at the last minute. If you're expecting a talk about Pygame Zero, uh, then I've changed it for a talk for something on a completely different topic. But if you want to talk to me about games programming, um, then uh, catch me at a different time. So um, though uh, I'm a hobbyist games programmer, my, um, uh, my professional life, I am a reliability engineer for a hedge fund. And uh, in this role, we have a lot of hosts that we want to uh, manage, uh, introspect, uh, orchestrate, and we've been using Ansible for that. Um, Ansible is a, uh, it's a, a framework for, um, uh, it's kind of like a, a SSH uh, transport, but then you control it with YAML. Um, and so your, the way that you extend it is by uh, writing scripts. Um, and then driving it through YAML. Um, and that had lots of limitations, which has inspired me to create something called Chopsticks, which I'm going to show you. So um, Chopsticks, like Ansible and also Fabric is in this space, allows you to run code on remote machines um, over SSH. Uh, Chopsticks will do this in parallel um, and without anything installed on the remote machine apart from Python and SSH, which is probably going to be pre-installed if you're using any kind of uh, uh, standard image. Um, and Chopsticks also has support for Docker, which we'll see. So this is, can everybody see that? Do I need to make that bigger? Um, so this is a Chopsticks script, which is, I imagine I've written a function called uh, git revision that's somewhere in my code base. Um, if I create a group object and I pass a list of hosts, um, then using the standard SSH binary um, and my SSH config. Can I have a glass? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, so. The group object has a method called call, and I can pass it a function, and the other arguments that I pass are arguments to that function. Um, and it will call that on all hosts in parallel, um, and returns a thing that's a bit like a dict, where it's a, it's a wrapper around a dict. Um, and I can iterate through the, the, the hosts and the return values. So that will work with any pickleable function, um, or pick pickleable uh, function and uh, pickleable arguments, uh, but the return value has to be JSON for reasons that I'll discuss in a second. So that's uh, just, it's so as I'm saying, it's normal Python code, this is something that exists in your code base, that could be the implementation of the, the git revision function that I'm calling in that example. Um, so, um, must be pure Python, there is some import magic that makes this work, and that import magic will not work with uh, C extensions. Um, the return value must be JSON serializable, and this is a restriction that I put in, because if you consider the security model, you, like, I'm running code on my laptop uh, against a bunch of servers. If any of those servers was compromised, I don't want my laptop to be compromised. So uh, pickles are insecure. Um, but if I'm executing arbitrary code on the remote machines anyway, uh, that's fine. I don't want execution of arbitrary code on my machine. Um, so I mentioned Docker. It works uh, in exactly the same way, ex uh, except that you can pass in these Docker objects. Um, and in this case, it will create uh, some containers. Use, it will download the images if I, if I don't have them. Uh, so that's running code against Three, uh, three different p Python versions. So that's um, uh, going to download the images for those three different Python versions, and it will call Python version in each one um, and print the results. Um, those, the Docker object is the analog of a tunnel object, which wraps an SSH connection. So if I wanted to do that on one uh, host at a time or Docker container at a time, that's, it's the same API for um, groups and for tunnels. Um, and there's also a local which will run in a subprocess. So this is all using the same machinery. Um, so you can test. You could test against different Docker versions. Uh, you could test against the local machine. So uh, Chopsticks is probably more testable than uh, some of the alternatives. 
Um, also, uh, so you can call functions, but obviously if you're uh, passing arguments, then you've got to have the arguments loaded into memory. Uh, one of the obvious things that you might want to like to do is uh, upload uh, files of an arbitrary size. Um, so there's streaming uploads that will happen um, over the, the pipes, over the uh, SSH in, in chunks, so that that's not loaded all into memory at the same time. Um, and the return values in that case include the paths that they were written to. So I've not, uh, you can specify a path, you can specify a mode, but I've not done that, and therefore they've been written to temp files. Um, and similarly, downloads. <coughs> so to put this in the context of uh, uh, other tools that exist in the space, Fabric um, is uh, a, a library that is built on SSH. Uh, it's built on Paramico, which is an SSH library. Um, but Fabric uh, has the ability to put files um, and run commands. Um, that's all using a single SSH connection, and SSH has this ability to have multiple channels within a single connection. Um, but what you're running there is um, bash. Basically, you're, so you're, you're wrapping bash commands in Python. So all you're running on the remote side is bash. Um, and you could obviously drop scripts over and run them and get the results back. Um, but that's not quite the same as having a code base that just works across hosts. Um, so Fabric compared to Chopsticks, it's wedded to SSH. So it will never do the stuff that it can do, that Chopsticks can do with Docker. Um, it's, it relies on that ability to create multiple channels uh, you, that SSH provides. Um, and uh, uh, you know, the other things I've said there, no persistent state on the remote side. Every script has got to um, uh, return a value, and the, the orchestration host drives it. Um, and there's some stuff about the execution model as well, like the way that you can run things in parallel or and, and tasks and that kind of thing. Uh, with Chopsticks, it's not. So the Fabric has a framework that allows you to, uh, to drive these things, whereas Chopsticks is just a library that will let you do stuff in parallel. You can do whatever you want. Um, Ansible, I mentioned the YAML. This is like the ugly YAML syntax of Ansible. Uh, that uh, th There are three different DSLs uh, nested within each other here. There's YAML, um, and then the double brackets, are, double braces are Ginger2. Um, and this line here with the equals, that's Ansible's own language for doing dictionaries in a different way. And why it has all of these things, that's a, that's a good question. It's, a, it's kind of a poorly implemented system, I would, I would say. So um, the YAML syntax notwithstanding, and this sort of ends up sort of feeling a lot like just bash scripting in, in YAML. We don't want to be doing that with Python programmers. So um, this is how you extend Ansible. If you want to uh, plug in Python into Ansible, you write a script, and it's a standalone script, and this is the, the API that uh, the Ansible provides. It has to look almost exactly like this. Even so, you know, you dislike the star imports, maybe, that's an Ansible feature. You've got to have that. Um, the, uh, the fact that it's a standalone script is a a real obstacle for me, I, I can't get over it, it's really annoying because I've got a library of functions that I want to be able to use, I want to be able to use them in different scripts, um, and there's no import support. The, the way this actually works is that Ansible will load that script, uh, where it matches, so it'll match that, um, uh, that line with a regular expression. Can I describe this line? Yeah, okay. So um, it will match that line with a regular expression, and it will insert the code into it. So it's trying to create in one script uh, your entire code base, except it only works for stuff that's built into Ansible. So Ansible is very extensible if you're developing the core of Ansible. It's not extensible if you are um, building your own tools. Um, it's also a bit slower because it's got to do, it, there's no persistent state. Again, it's, it's creating a script, shipping it over, running it, pulling the results back. Um, so I come to the conclusion that Ansible is much more about that YAML syntax, and the Python that exists is just about power powering that YAML syntax to be powerful enough to do what you want to do. Um, so Chopsticks. Um, it is, in comparison, it's testable, it's documentable, you know the tools already. Um, I've not built into it the kind of 
framework that is on top of Fabric and, uh, and Ansible, and I think that is an advantage, that you can use this for more diverse things. Um, although, obviously, if you, there, at this point, this is more of a kind of, uh, this is a very early release of Chopsticks, and I think we could get to a point where some of the stuff is available in the Chopsticks library. Um, so, to explain a bit about how the magic of Chopsticks works, um, there are three tricks uh, to getting, how long have I got? Okay. Um, there are three tricks to making this work, and so we've got to create a process on the remote side that we can uh, get our own code running in. Uh, we've got to exchange messages with it, so, the, so we're sort of building an agent that can talk to us over the, the, the channel that we use to build it, um, and then we're going to have it import code um, using that channel as well. Um, so bootstrapping an agent is basically the minus C option to Python. Um, and when you uh, put that into an SSH command line, like this command line, um, we can write some bootstrap code uh, that will run at the end of a, an SSH tunnel. So SSH is forwarding uh, std in over the pipe to the remote host, and it's forwarding std uh, and std out back to the, to the uh, calling process. So what we've effectively got is a connection, a std in, std out, std uh, connection to a remote process. And this, this script will, this, the, what we put in the minus C is just enough to read an initial script that will bootstrap a process that can uh, exchange messages. So the exchanging messages uh, is just uh, chunking the stood in and stood out into uh, chunks based on size, and there's a request ID and an operation, operation code and some other stuff. So this is slightly simplified. Um, uh, on the uh, remote side, that's all uh, done with threads. On the controller side, because you're going to want to parallelize this a lot, it's uh, an async loop, and there's an async system built into chopsticks to avoid adding an extra dependency. Uh, and to, to allow it to work with Python uh, 2.7 as well as uh, Python 3. Um, so then the final trick is importing code. So once we've got a message transport, so we, we're passing messages uh, in these chunks, uh, and the chunks could contain call uh, operations or uh, the chunks of data for putting a file, um, and similarly return values and chunks of data for getting a file. Uh, then we can import code. So there's a, a message which, so uh, this is the, I don't know if you can see this. So uh, to explain this diagram, uh, the orchestration host issues a call uh, operation as a message over the, over the transport. Uh, the remote process uh, will decide it needs to import something and using the import hook system of uh, PEP302, uh, it can, we, can, we can plug in a, a piece of Python code that will do whatever we want with an import request. It can send that back to the orchestration host and the orchestration host can go, well, that's in my file system or my sys.path somewhere um, and send the file back or uh, if the file doesn't exist, it can send the, the fact that there's no, no file. Uh, and then it will do that as many times as is needed to load, your, load the code base into memory. Um, and hand back the return value. And obviously, because you are keeping the Python process alive for the entire duration that the, the tunnel is alive, um, it's caching more and more of that code in memory. So uh, it's, there's no sort of repeated step if you want to reuse a function from within that code base. And obviously, functions can call functions. They can import. They can do anything that Python can do. It's just loading the code from somewhere else. Um, so. Uh, from Brandon's talk this morning, he was talking about interactivity. Um, and so I've got a, a quick demo of uh, uh, a REPL uh, that is built with... Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, so this is already connected, but what I've done is uh, the, the Docker example earlier. So imagine this works over SSH, but the network here, I'm not going to trust it. Um, but I've created uh, three Docker instances uh, that are um, using different versions of Python. Um, so if I went to, if I did, uh, unfortunately, because they're all Docker instances and they're created at the same time, they're mostly the same. Um, if I do sys.version, you can see that they're different versions. So this is, imagine 
interactively exploring the Python environment on every machine in your infrastructure. Um, that probably kind of scary. Um, but if you were developing a chopstick script, you have the ability to do it interactively and to explore sort of uh, the whether, you know, try a piece of code, see whether it works on all of your machines as opposed to just the machine that you were inspecting when you wrote it. Um, as I say, this is a, uh, uh, a relatively new project. Um, it's uh, um, uh, I created it in in July. Uh, I was actually I was on holiday and I was daydreaming about like how I could improve Ansible. Um, so it was uh, it was a fun holiday, but also I came out of it with uh, this itch to just sort of go and program. So uh, this is a couple of months old, um, but in that time I've sort of built out the capabilities for it to uh, uh, obviously you know proof of concept that it could actually do this. That I could the the ideas that came into my head those three tricks uh, would actually work. Um, but now it has, uh, as I say, Docker support. It has the ability to get and send files. Um, the, I, I didn't describe this, but the Studer, it gets tagged so you can see what host uh, Studer comes from. So debugging can go on Studer. Um, and I think this is ready to be used in, uh, cautiously in, uh, in applications. Um, so uh, I think I'm not going to get this to the point where it is a replacement for Ansible. Um, or, or Fabric, it's a library for you to do what you want with. Um, and if somebody wants to write an orchestration framework on it or adapt Ansible modules to run over this, uh, then uh, I would be happy to accept pull requests, etc. Um, something that I'm going to need quite soon, I think, uh, if, if I'm bringing this into, into my organization to use in production, um, is the ability to uh, proxy effectively. So. Um, you could imagine you use chopsticks to get onto a host and then you import chopsticks and you use that to connect to lots of machines. So uh, that should be relatively transparent. Um, but uh, it's something that there's like a couple of blockers to, to actually doing that. Um, and of course, you might want to use sudo to execute your... Uh, to, to, uh, so sudo will do exactly the same thing as uh, Docker or SSH, which is connect you to... Or, uh, the connect the stood in and stood out of your sub-process to a remote Python that is executing uh, arbitrary code. And therefore, you could have uh, a, a pipe that is connecting to sudo. So if you, so sub-tunnels, as I described, you could connect to a remote host. You could SSH off to other hosts. Connect to a remote host, open a tunnel to sudo, uh, and to do some things, some operations of sudo. And that should all work transparently. Um, and again, if you can think of any situation, I'm sure I'm racking my brain for other situations where there is a command that will forward you the stood in and stood out of a, a process that is modified in some way, um, and it's, it's relatively easy to just wrap that up as chopsticks because um, the transport doesn't change, very little changes apart from the arguments that you provide on the command line. Um, so that is the uh, documentation links, that's the GitHub, that's the PyPI, uh, it's just pip installable. Um, thank you very much. So, is this working? You picking that up? Yep. Wonderful. Has anyone got any questions? What's the uh, largest number of hosts you've parallelly... Uh, <laughs> Three. <this> <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned there are a couple of blockers uh, and some uh, issues earlier. Are those documented on the uh, GitHub? Yeah, they're, sorry, they're open on GitHub. So one of the issues with... So um, the script that is bootstrapped, that is, that is passed on stood in... So, OK, you do the minus C thing. Uh, the script that you pass on stood in to set up the message channel uh, is loaded with um, package util get data. Um, and that is not implemented in my import hook. So the import hook needs a couple of fixes as well um, to make it completely conformant to what your local import would, do, would be doing. Um, but uh, there is just implement a method on the import hook and then it would be able to get that data and then it would be able to uh, work recursively. So 
contributors just yeah who request gratefully accepted yeah Um, say I've got uh, a virtual environment on my server. Can I uh, run the Python within that? Hmm. Uh, yes. So, um, so actually, uh, the the tunnel classes. The um, uh, I probably don't have network, but um, uh, the tunnel classes have a couple of class attributes uh, that include the Python binary to use. Um, the uh, there also is just a, a method to so if you want to construct an arbitrary tunnel, uh, you can just subclass like pipe tunnel. Uh, you have to implement a constructor that takes whatever you want to set up the tunnel, and um, then command args is a method that will return the arguments that you run as a subprocess that connects you to that remote Python. So uh, so it's it's easily customizable. Uh, for a virtual env, you would just need to subclass tunnel and say your Python binary is this. Um, however, uh, that would require two connections then, because you need to, if you wanted to create the virtual environment in the first place, you would need to do that, and then you'd need to quit it and get into the the virtual env one. And second question: that interactive thing looked really cool. Is there a way of doing that with Bash or with a shell, just to run, you know, against n remote terminals and see the responses? Um, no. Anyone no. know the answer to that? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> any any more questions? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you.